One of my favorite early access games to come out this year is Turbo Overkill. I love it when a game comes out that I haven't heard anything of and everything is a fresh experience. Turbo Overkill benefited from that, for me. It was a game that defines the concept of promising. With some changes here and there, it could be great. And as it's seen updates, it's become a really solid game. If it weren't an early access title, it would make my best of the year list. And I've been looking forward to Act 2 ever since I finished Act 1. And now it's finally in my hands. And it's kind of a mixed bag. I can't go into Act 2 all impressed by how the game plays. That already happened with Act 1. And it's not like anything in Act 2 makes Act 1 bad. Act 1 is still great. It's better, actually, since the game has seen enhancements like a pain state system after enemies have taken a certain amount of damage. A nice general combat improvement. So we're looking at Act 2 just as Act 2 of a game that I already liked. What does it add, and how does it take things further? First, I want to look at the new weapons. Right away, you're given the plasma rifle, which I'll admit for a while feels redundant. In a game where you already have so many great offensive options, introducing a plasma rifle now is a little underwhelming. But then you unlock the first upgrade, the microwave beam. God damn it, I wanted to make it through this video without a Doom Eternal reference, but come on, microwave beam? That's one of my favorite Doom Eternal weapon mods, and I have four videos on how to use it. It's one of the weapons I'm known for in the community. So I was ecstatic to see it in Turbo Overkill. This time, it's a little different. Instead of causing stun locks and faltering surrounding enemies upon explosion, this iteration has the ability to lock onto three different enemies and drain them of their life, showing all their HP in individual readouts. And what makes this mod so cool is that you can lock onto enemies and take cover, cooking them from behind the wall. As if that weren't good enough, the second upgrade comes along and blows the first one out of the water. Putting the plasma rifle into projectile mode allows you to catch enemy projectiles and send them at whoever you want. Turning this plasma rifle into maybe the coolest weapon I've ever seen, you can even fire the rocket launcher and catch the rocket to supercharge it and then send it where you want. As the game goes on, you'll find an upgrade for the chain gun that removes the delay before firing, making it a much more user-friendly gun to pull out in the chaos of battle. However, this upgrade makes the Uzis feel less important, so it's nice to see them get their own upgrade that turns the single Uzi into a powerful long-range assault rifle. Personally, I still find the Uzis to be a weapon that doesn't really have a strong role in Turbo Overkill, since when I'm fighting at long range, I tend to be using rockets or explosives anyway. Another weapon you'll find is a sniper rifle, and while I think it's a cool gun, this is so not a sniper style game. I rarely ever used it, even though it eventually gets a charge up rail cannon ability that does a lot of damage. It's just an odd weapon to throw into the mix, and when the railgun is charging, it's hard to see what I'm aiming at. But hey, if there's anything I learned from my Proteus video, it's to not underestimate a weapon that doesn't have an obvious application to me. The grenade launcher in Proteus is actually very good, and now I love using it. The sniper rifle does have a unique ability, though. Charging it up allows you to telefrag into any low-tier enemy. You can teleport yourself across the room, exploding their body, crossing very large distances. Again, a very cool ability, I just didn't use it much outside of the parts where it's very obvious that it would be to my benefit. So yeah, the other weapons are cool, could be cooler. Wait, maybe the plasma rifle isn't the coolest weapon after all. Back in the day, Command & Conquer introduced us to the Ion Cannon, a targeted satellite-guided laser beam that would destroy nearly every structure in the enemy base, or at least do significant damage. It has existed in many forms throughout the franchise, even getting to the point where you could direct it and damage multiple buildings or enemy units. The Ion Cannon is badass, so imagine my reaction when I saw it featured as a weapon in Turbo Overkill. Wow, forget the plasma rifle, this might be the coolest weapon I've ever seen.
And look, I'm not here to talk about balance. That was largely a concern for Act 1. It was important to me for Act 1 to push smart gameplay and offer appropriate difficulty levels for new players. But now that we're in Act 2, we're going into this experience as people who like playing Turbo Overkill. So if something exists that is overpowered, I don't necessarily care at this point, I'm just having fun playing more of the game. Before I move on to the part of this video where criticism starts creeping its way in, I've just got a gush about the fun I'm having with these creative new mechanics. My second playthrough of Act 2 with all the weapons unlocked was a lot more fun than the first, and I'm not typically the kind of guy that enjoys new game plus modes when the combat encounters haven't been remixed. But I feel strongly that, while the fun of Act 1 was found in the challenging combat and the awesome level design, the fun of Act 2 is found in mastering interesting weapon mechanics and doing crazy shit. I found myself enjoying my time with Act 2 way more as I replayed certain parts trying to record specific footage for this video. I was quite proud of myself when I thought, hey, can I shoot a super shotgun sticky bomb and a rocket and still have time to catch both with a plasma rifle? And it turned out I could. I think Act 2 is going to come alive for a lot of people on repeat playthroughs just experimenting with their options. Alright, let's move on. A few new enemies have been introduced, namely the Rammer and the Shocker. The Rammer has a fast launching mace that does massive damage, and he charges at you very fast. A simple enemy, but a problematic one due to his high health. The Shocker puts force fields on surrounding enemies, so you gotta kill him before you can damage the rest. Though as you damage him, he'll falter, which gives a window to damage other enemies before you actually kill him. We've got super annoying flying parasite enemies that are going to drive people crazy until they figure out they should just dash back and use the pistol lock-on to kill all of them easily. There's also shield guys, who can be killed with explosives like the super shotgun grenade or the remote detonation rocket launcher. But you can also shoot a shotgun stun grenade at them, which overcharges their shields and causes them to explode and kill enemies around them. We're starting to see some more enemies with weapon-specific weaknesses, but they aren't weaknesses that you absolutely have to use. There are other ways to dispose of them. Act 2 of Turbo Overkill really wants you to see the functionality of new weapons or unconsidered tactics, as evidenced by the Tutorials and Corruption Zones. I'm in support of tutorials when they're introducing new mechanics that enhance gameplay experience, but not when they tell you things you already know very well. I'm glad that the shield guys have a tutorial that tells you about the waster stun grenade popping their shields. That's nice, but later enemies like the Rammer have tutorials telling you to dodge their ramming attack by dashing away. And really, at this point in Act 2 of Turbo Overkill, who isn't already using the dash liberally? Something like that doesn't need to be tutorialized. He should just show up and we can deal with him. We don't need to be told to jump over ground shockwave attacks when we've already experienced hours and hours of airborne gameplay. I'm hoping that some of the more obvious tutorials are removed while keeping the unique ones. The final state of the game may indeed have some of them gone already. The Corruption Zones are a whole other story. They're areas that cause all of your weapons to shut down except one. These sections are going to be very controversial, because no one likes having to pass a fight with just one weapon, especially in a game that celebrates so much weapon diversity. I was generally on board for a while in the first encounters. The first one makes you use the plasma rifle after having recently unlocked the microwave beam mod. That was okay because it got me experimenting with it and after that point I was using it a lot. It was a fine forced teaching moment. The second corruption zone limited me to only the rocket launcher, and now I couldn't get on top of the drones to kill them with the super shotgun from above, I started using remote detonation to damage them, a lesson I took into later encounters. And this also shows people that you can kill the shield guys with rockets when you don't have stun grenades. So the early corruption zones were getting me to notice strategies I hadn't paid attention to, or simply didn't notice. I was happy about that. But later corruption zones didn't have the same effect for me. Just using the sniper rifle didn't really expand my knowledge of the weapon, and a corruption zone where I can only use the super shotgun didn't do much for me either. It got me to do quick swapping to skip the reload animation so I could fire faster, since my only source of damage was that one gun, but that's not something that the corruption zone taught me, and I doubt anyone who doesn't know about quick swapping is going to pick up on it from this encounter. Corruption zones ultimately end up feeling a bit half-baked, and maybe with updates they'll fit in better. Let's talk a bit about the bosses. The first boss zooms around at lightning speed after taking a certain amount of damage, and then after he's taken a lot of damage, he'll be stunned and you can combo him. 
He will utterly destroy your life bar in mere seconds, so fortunately he drops health pickups when he gets hit. Honestly, it's not that great of a fight. It's better than it was. Originally the fight was a lot more limited, it ended up feeling like a corruption zone. I'm glad it was changed to be more active, but it's still nothing to write home about. I think this fight still needs a lot of work. The second boss of Act 2 is equally disappointing, if not more so. Activate slow motion to hit her. So you just run around and wait for slow mo to come back, and then you attack, and then repeat. Eventually she creates holograms, but they aren't much of a threat, and the strategy stays the same. Unlike the first boss, I beat her on my first try virtually without effort, and I think there needs to be other enemies in this fight, maybe some hazards, because right now it's really bare bones. Compared to the boss fight at the end of Act 1, which was one of the best boss fights I've ever seen in a first person shooter, Act 2's boss fights simply don't meet the mark. As we're on the topic of disappointing things, we gotta talk about the motorcycle section. The chainsaw cycle is one of the main things advertised leading up to the release of Act 2, and it ends up being the worst part of the experience. I feel bad for saying that because Turbo Overkill is made by one guy, and I know some of my feedback has been taken into consideration. I even appeared as an easter egg in Act 1, something I will be forever happy about. I'm sure a lot of time went into making this cycle sequence, but I gotta be honest and say that I think this is pretty bad and the game would be better off without it. Nothing about the combat or driving with the cycle is interesting. The spectacle of the environment isn't all that impressive, though I'm sure it took a long time to put together. The hazards are nullified by the fact that you aren't constantly being propelled forward like in some driving games, so if you see a fire hazard you just stop, wait for it to finish, and then move on. And worse, the controls don't feel right. There's zero sense of weight to the cycle, which is so disappointing because the flying section of Act 1 was pretty cool, and it definitely felt like it had its own feel. It was heavy, it felt like you were really controlling a gunship. The motorcycle feels like it has exactly the same weight and sensitivity as your character. It doesn't feel like a bike, so it's super unsatisfying to drive. I think maybe they've tried to go further than their current capabilities with this installment, and the result is that we have sections of the game that feel less than fully realized. I feel that too in the level design. While Act 2 isn't without its impressive sights here and there, it feels much less fine-tuned in a lot of other areas, and I didn't get that dramatic feeling of entering interesting spaces like I did in Act 1. Remember how Act 1 had that incredible purple retro room, and the place where you shoot out the holographic panels to enter that weird digital space? I didn't get those moments from Act 2, it feels more conventional. That's not to say there aren't great additions to the game in the level design department. The new grappling hook ability not only expands your mobility in combat, but also allows for very vertical designs and secrets and entertaining platforming sections, though we don't get much in the way of actual platforming puzzles and hazards, which I think is a missed opportunity. Arena fights featuring grappling hooks are nice, and you can grapple onto any enemy so there's always an opportunity to get airborne and rain down chaos from above. In addition to the grappling hook, you'll also gain Turbo Time, which is the slow motion ability you get from killing the first boss. Turbo Time is a big part of Act 2's combo rhythm, as it gives you a damage boost, makes you invulnerable, correction, it just reduces incoming damage now, and can be upgraded to give you ammo from every kill. You can use this to focus down a few big guys in every fight, and overall I just found it a really fun option to use in combination with everything else. There's nothing better than shooting four rockets into the air, activating turbo time, catching the rockets with the plasma rifle, hurling them at the enemies, and then activating the ion cannon. You'll notice my mic sounds a little different now, I had to record this video in a large room so the audio came out a little weird. But now I'm back in a normal space, so sorry for the sudden quality change. Right before publishing this video, I was able to play an updated build of Act 2 that contained the last level, which is the big boss fight. And as I was playing it, I realized that I didn't communicate myself well on my opinion of the levels. Act 1 had some solid, memorable changes to its level structure. Using the gunship to navigate puzzle-like tunnels was a highlight of Act 1, as was the train section. Act 2 really didn't deliver those moments outside of the cycle section. 
In the visual department, it still looks great. The developer has definitely expanded on their skills and made some awesome levels that look amazing and have moments where the visuals impress. What's missing specifically is the wow factor. Moments where you go, holy shit, what is this place? So yeah, I'm not saying that Act 2 looks bad or doesn't have awesome parts of the levels. It's just that it doesn't blow me away like Act 1. Which leads me to the final boss fight. This section contains spoilers for the final boss, so if you want to skip that, go to this timecode. The final boss starts with a really cool stadium announcement, creating hype for the fight. And once the boss shows up, the level starts morphing into different zones from other levels. It's a cool visual experience, and your navigation options are changing while you fight. The boss has a laser wall that blocks your path, and he shoots large fireballs. There's even a cool section in the middle that connects different phases where the visuals start doing all these digital effects that I missed from Act 1. The question is, is the boss fight better than the other two? And I gotta be honest and say no. The spectacle is cool. Everything surrounding the fight is great. But the fight itself feels exactly like the second boss fight, which was just bouncing around until your turbo time comes back and then DPSing him into oblivion. It resulted in a pretty dull conclusion to Act 2, and it got me thinking more and more about the balance of Turbo Time, and how maybe this thing shouldn't be on a cooldown. Maybe it should be rechargeable somehow through your actions. My two ideas are, one, every kill refills a sliver of Turbo Time, and two, damaging bosses causes them to drop Turbo Time recharge items. And Turbo Time granting full invincibility seems a bit ridiculous when you consider how many times you can get it during a fight. I think maybe we should go for just a damage reduction. And maybe just a small damage reduction because you're getting health pickups from the enemies you kill. I don't know, something needs to be done to make these fights more than just activating Turbo Time and then waiting for it to come back. Something else needs to be going on. In conclusion, Act 2 of Turbo Overkill is pretty good, but probably not the epic continuation that many are expecting. It doesn't do anything to take away from the awesome experience that is Turbo Overkill, and it makes some great additions for offense, defense, and mobility, but it doesn't reach the highs of Act 1 in regards to interesting level design and boss battles. Going forward, I hope the developer hones their focus more and plays more to their strengths. If that happens, we could get an Act 3 that expands on the game in interesting ways like Act 2 does, while retaining and improving the core combat and exploration experience of Act 1. Thanks for watching.